How are you? I'm okay. How are you doing? Very good. Very good to hear your voice, to meet you. Give me a sort of sense, give me a sense of who you are. Yeah. My work is uh, connected to posthuman philosophies, plural. Although myself, I define myself as a posthumanist philosopher. In that sense, uh, we are in dialogue with uh, many different communities of people who are really mm, reflecting about what does it mean to be human in the 21st century. And in this reflection, all these groups of people that are very different groups of people, but all of these groups of people agree on the fact that the human is not an, a closed notion, but is an open notion that is constantly evolving and changing. And in this sense, if these changes are going to be extremely radical, for instance, on a biotechnological level, some groups are saying, well, we're not going to be, we are no longer human. While other people are saying we have never been human. So let's say that all these groups, you know, post-humanists and transhumanists, anti-humanists, meta-humanists, new materialism, object oriented ontology, there's so much going on. But all of these groups agree on the fact that the, the human, it's, it's an open notion that has to be revisited in the light of what, was, what is happening in the 21st century. And in this, uh, uh, it's uh, really what I call the philosophy of our time. Uh, but so told, um, it's also important to underline that these movements do not necessarily agree with each other. And that's also it's w what is very inspiring and fascinating. It's not just one voice, it's many voices. And some of these voices are saying almost uh, <laughs> opposite things, but doesn't matter because all of them are really revisiting the, the notion of who we are. It sounds like you're a diplomat when you, as you're expressing. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, you know, you know, Johnny, can I say something about what you said? Thanks. Well, I say this because um, there was a one point in history, it was like 10 years ago, in which some of these groups were so much on the edges that they would not even be in dialogue with each other. And I think that the point of existence is uh, learning in plurality through others because we are always changing, we are others. So for me, although, for instance, myself, I, I do define myself as a posthumanist, I do see some great gifts that other communities are bringing to the conversation. So I don't think that there will be anything posthuman about me to go into war about other people who are saying things that are different from what I'm saying. So in that sense, my work has been a first to really clarify the map of the posthuman in philosophical terms. And then also, of course, clarify what is my voice in this. But in this mapping, I also made sure not only to underline the differences that have been very clear in the community, but also what is uh, that we share. And it's also, that's, there is a lot to that as well. So sometimes the communities, you know, although they're all labeled by others as posthuman, for people who don't know, uh, really the communities are really saying many different things. And this is because that's happening. And I always bring the example of being a humanist in the Renaissance. And that term was not even there, but there were so many people rediscussing the human from a post-theocentric approach in which now the human is divine. Doesn't mean that God is gone because a lot of these people were also Christians in this, in this sense. Uh, I'm thinking specifically of European Renaissance. But uh, at the time, no one would just say, oh, they're all humanists. They were all in dialogue with each other and many would not agree with each other. And the term itself came later on. So I think that the, for me, the richness of the community is not just uh, specific visions, but the plurality of voices with the main uh, um, message, which is what does it mean to be human? And yes, there is not one answer. There are un unlimited numbers of, of, uh, of possible answers we can give to this. And that's for me the beauty. It's really not leaving anything as granted, uh, being able to re-envision and rethinking and reopening any kind of door. But give me a sort of sense of like how you grew up and how you came to be interested in this and how you've made it a vocation. All right, so in this, uh, uh, I do see a lot of similarities with FM 2030. I do see myself, myself I always seen myself as a citizen of the world. Uh, and in that sense, my first big desire of existence was uh, traveling and learning all different kind of possible ways of living, uh, experiencing all kinds of communities, of all kinds of visions and uh, experiences. So my early ages, it was, uh, my goal was just being able to travel. So I would, you know, like I, I embraced a lot of uh, radical ideas and it was really experimenting with life and learning all kinds of communities. Um, so in order to really understand that um, 
you know, in Italy, they, they have a nice proverb that it's uh, all the world is in the end is, is like a town. And in this town, there are people who are doing things that are positive for the community, others who are not. Some are really getting high insights and some others are not. So those characters that are uh, part of the human species, you really find those characters in any kind of community, in any kind of nation, in any kind of ethnicity. So for me, at first it was really exploring what does it mean to be human, literally. The way also was expressing myself and being free to express myself. In this sense, uh, the first love was not philosophy, it was the literature. I wrote uh, since I can remember writing, like, and uh, uh, that was my first uh, passion, like writing. And in that sense, I felt completely free because uh, I was the master. I could do anything with the pen, you know. And philosophy came later on when I realized that um, it was not anymore sufficient to imagine. It was important to be able to um, express what's happening. And by being able to express what's happening, being able to change that with the language that is very specific. And that philosophy was was it uh, and I'm still into that I think that eventually I'm going to jump eventually into a third passage which is mythology because I think the philosophy is incredible to, to give you the tools to describe reality as precise as you can but it's also true that your audience is limited to people who have a, 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 a love for that kind of uh, writing or that kind of language which is very specific and it's, it takes time to train your brain. I remember when I, I started to do my passage from literature to philosophy, I would literally sometimes fall asleep reading philosophical texts. And it was not because I was bored. It was because my brain was literally tired. It was, it's just a different type of the brain. It's not that you're not using your brain. It's just there are different parts of the brain that you use for different things. So not everyone is trained in philosophy, although I do think that we are all philosophers because every person uh, at a very young age, start asking, what is that? And why is this? And, and then they find possible answers. But the question itself is something that comes with every human being. So in that sense, we are all philosophers. And then some people train into that in the field, which is great. But by being so trained, the risk is that no one outside of the community can understand you. So mythology in that sense, I find it that it's uh, kind of go beyond uh, communities because mythology is really at the core of, of human society uh, and, and societies were built through mythologies so I think that eventually of course the mythology of the 21st century are medias and, and movies and, 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 and TV series and in that sense I agree with FM 2030 that there is a desert land desert of things that can be said about the future and instead of writing about the future most people write about the past and the present in futuristic dresses when did you first when were you first aware of fm 2030 and give me a sort of a sense of like what was your impression and i guess the follow-up question uh, after seeing the film was there any side of fm that you weren't aware or made you rethink the sort of the place that you had put him. Thank you in this, because I, did, I, I, I got, a, a, you know, being an academic, one of the things that you need to do is, a, wait, one thing that you should do, not everyone does, but it's really understanding your sources. So when I first started to really work in this, one thing I had to do is really get into all the sources and learning, and of course, in this uh, genealogical effort to understand all the main voices, of course, I encountered FM 2030, in the, uh, to learn more about transhumanism, because he's more specifically transhumanist. Uh, and I maybe I should later on clarify a little the difference between trans and posthumanism. But, uh, you know, like, as, as, again, I define this as a community with different voices. And although my voice is not a transhumanist one, there is a lot of, uh, of insights that the transhumanist movement is bringing to all of us, all of us as humans beyond the posthuman community. So in this sense, I, I, got, to, I got aware of his presence in this debate very early. Um, I got, uh, I, I didn't have the chance to meet him, obviously, because I moved here later on and I, I, it, my work started when he was, he had already passed away. And your movie for me was an incredible gift because I realized that he was not only a, you know, a sharp intellectual and a philosophical visionary, but it really, I almost saw him as, um, those who are very special people and no matter what kind of age, historical age they're born, no matter from which family they're born from, no matter how they look, they're going to inspire people and bring their voice with so much passion and kindness and, and insights and, and, um, and vision that they're going to move people's life. And I didn't know he was like that because I, you know, I met a lot of 
you know, famous people, but not all of them are, are inspiring people. They might be inspiring intellectual or they might be inspiring scientists, but they might not be people that I would like to hang out with, let's say. Um, they might be caught too much into their own research or too much into their own ego or whatever it is. With him, since I never met him, uh, I got to realize that he's one of those exceptional humans that again, they are ahistorical. That's why, yeah, he can definitely come back to the future because he's going to be fine with whatever age. He can also go back to the past if they were coming to come with a time machine. Because I think that at any age he's going to be, he's going to be one of those people who move people's life and, and, and shake people's ideas and push you to think how he could always, always be so kind and inspiring and visionary, no matter the situation, talking to a child or talking to a very famous person, talking in TV or talking at the dinner table. And then I realized, okay, he's one of the exceptional humans that uh, it's a pleasure to meet, no matter what time, what era, what age, how long, those are those people that are staying in your heart. And I can see now why you were so touched by him and why you wanted to give your, your, your tribute to him. And you did some, I think he would be very proud of you because you did it, uh, something that is original and is uh, different. So uh, it, it was good for me to watch this. So thank you. I mean, it was thank you. No, thank you for, no, thank you for watching. I mean, no, it was really one of our, you know, it was always like, how do we make something that's entertaining and also not sort of dull down the part that was a tribute because he was, you know, a very special person, not just because of his intellect, as you point out, like he really was one of these very few people in my life that I've met. And I've been also lucky to have met lots of celebrated people and, and so on. But he really was incredibly... For him, it really was like, what does it mean to be human? Like he was so like, and, and the, the place that I come to is this, this empathy, is this like really wanting to understand other people and, and, and make them feel seen and heard and so on. So to me, those people are very few and far between, especially then throw in his intellect and so on. So yeah, no, that, that's a nice thing that you, that, that hope that I'm glad came through. We intentionally didn't, you know, make um, this film about a particular strand of post-human post or transhumanism. I mean, in part because, to me, this was about a dialogue of what it means to be human today and what do we want. Yeah, he's definitely considered a transhumanist, probably also because of the book he, he wrote, you know, you transhuman, and also, also because of his ideas. So, and now, <laughs> having seen your movie, I can see him and as someone who could definitely also reevaluate some of the ideas that, for instance, for me are interesting but are limited. Um, so, for instance, one thing that he stressed a lot, which is important to stress, is, for instance, the current limitation of the biological body. So, why not trying to expand our lifespan, if not even getting rid of that, you know? Uh, why not embracing more uh, our technology and why not and which I, again I didn't know for instance the fact he, he chose only the, the cranial um, cryo, uh, preservation and he was totally fine uh, this is very interesting when Flora says that he was actually happy about the idea of having a robotic body which to me also was interesting to hear because I didn't know that uh, you know that was a prospect that uh, because some, I know that some of the transhumanists are thinking in the future of a technology that can rebuild biological bodies. So more than being excited about having a robotic body, most of them, the one that I talk to, they are, if they just do the head, it's because they're thinking about some type of technology that can regenerate their own bodies. Now, um, this is, uh, the transhumanist uh, goal, it's pretty easy to understand. Uh, transhumanists want to go uh, beyond what we uh, have been considered human. Uh, and also very important to say that they are not, uh, it's not something that everyone should embrace. There are also most of them uh, really un underline the fact that it should be your right to embrace this, but also should be, should be your right not to embrace this. So it's not that you know, they're thinking about the government pushing on transhumanist ideas uh, you know, on everyone. Although there, are, there is now the transhumanist party, but again, we are within a democratic frame. Eh? So, uh, because I know that some people are saying, what well, if you're against it? And, I don't, I don't know any transhumanist who said that this should be forced upon anyone. So it should be a right, but it should be a right. Um, now, the posthumanist approach is different. So we do agree um, on the fact that, that, yeah, that the human is definitely an open, is a work in progress. Um, but the thing is that uh, the, the, the posthuman really underlines the connection of the human with everything else. For instance, uh, historically, the human has been defined 
in a uh, dichotomy, which means a rigid dualism, a separation from the non-human. So the non-human is the less than human. This is why, for instance, we can kill other animals for leisure or for, for food, uh, or uh, uh, you know, in, in some religions, it's, it is stated that, for instance, the human are created in the image of God, which supposedly would give a, a human a primacy. Now, this has been deconstructed by the posthumanist approach in the sense uh, we are not exceptional. We are different, yes, but uh, we are different in a, in a plural, pluralistic view of, of existence in which this difference doesn't mean that I can, for instance, treat animals in inhumane ways, which is the, the case, for instance, of uh, the, uh, the, the farm industry at the moment. This is why I also didn't know that uh, FM2030 was a, was a vegan or vegetarian. This, this also came as a nice surprise because a lot of transhumanists don't really care about that, don't care so much about non-human life, which for me is, is a limit, is a limit. And this is something that may eventually want to change, but I see this uh, at the moment very present, very humanistic, anthropocentric approach to enhance the human specifically. And this for me is a problem because we no, cannot forget that we are in the era of the Anthropocene, which is the ge geological era in which uh, the human is recognized as a geological force. So until uh, this construction, this notion, we thought of the human as just one of, among many not really having an impact on the biosphere, but now we know that that's not true. So with this kind of knowledge, and I'm sure that FM 2030 would have agreed, uh, we can no longer see the human in separation and as something that we can think of our enhancement without really considering all the other implications, the biosphere, non-human others, etc., etc. So as a posthumanist, uh, uh, I'm not against uh, human enhancement, but for me it's very important to not uh, uh, go on with the repetition of the humanistic uh, ideal, which is a hierarchical notion of the human, I brought the example of human in separation from non-human animals, in which the human is the plus and the non-human is the minus. But of course, within hierarchical idea, the human is not one, but it's also a hierarchy. So some humans have been considered more human than others. Uh, think of the history of uh, racism, sexism, classism, ethnocentrism, Islamophobia, homophobia, uh, you name it. I mean, <laughs> there are endless cases. So, you know, they, on this, we really uh, have a lot to pick from. But the idea for me is really trying to work on all of these, to really bring to the future what I want to see. Uh, and for me, what I want to see uh, is not just uh, uh, enhancing human life, but enhancing the existential condition for, uh, for, for every, every type of existence that is manifesting in the 21st century, including robots. Because in my idea, I, um, and this is not mine, this is posthumanism, we also go beyond biocentrism. So yes, respect for non-human life, but also respect for, for instance, technological life, or let's not bring life as a notion, technological entities. So I think that um, we, are, we are in this together, as we have understood through COVID-19, we are in this together, uh, but we cannot think of this we in, in a hierarchical way. So if we're talking about enhancement, we really need to be honest and being able to, 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 to reflect on this without layers of, of supremacy. And this supremacy can also, can also be the species. So in this sense, I'm sure, that, uh, I'm sure of this, that uh, FN 2030 uh, would have had uh, maybe a little change in the idea of just uh, the human. There is a beautiful part in which um, he says, uh, if you can connect with, uh, in your movie, eh? if you can connect to your brother or sister or father or mother, if uh, uh, someone who is Jewish can connect uh, from, you know, with someone who is from Israel or from uh, America, doesn't matter because they connect to the religion, or someone who is Muslim can connect, no matter if they are from Morocco or from Indonesia, he said, we can connect as humans. He said, I'm sure we can do it and understand how much, how good we can do with this connection. But the only thing with this is, um, is the risk of having this uh, human supremacy. Eh? In another point also in, the, in your movie, uh, he says to someone in your family or, or to you uh, that you really cannot take pride in an ethnicity or in a nation. You can only take pride in what you do as a person, but also to be part of a species. So I would agree partially, but for me, the species is an issue because the, 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 risk, the risk is anthropocentrism. And I'm, I'm sure that someone as enlightened he was, he would definitely see this. So when he's come back to the future, I'm sure he's going to write the next book, which is going to be, are you a posthuman? <laughs> Some of this is semantics. I mean, semantics are important, language is important, but so far everything that you've said 
again, I'm not FM, I'm not even, probably, there's probably people who knew FM better, but like everything that you said to me, he would have agreed with. I mean, he would have given his slant, maybe the language would have been a little bit different, but everything, and, and honestly, the line in the film, and it's only one of the only lines in the film that we redid because to help us with the narrative. Wait, so, this is how some people like to talk to, with you because it's your movie slash documentary or, or doc, uh, doc movie, movie doc, whatever you want to call it, is an interesting case of uh, merging a documentary with fiction. So I don't want him to, re- to be put in the, the okay, bucket. Okay. <laughs> um, That's interesting though. <laughs> I mean, I imagine that there are, well, I know because I've spoken to some of them where it isn't as clear cut and, and I don't think, but so far this, there, in terms of FM's brand of transhumanism, you and him are copacetic so far. If there's, I'm trying to think in terms of, and because certainly he talked about robot rights. In fact, one of the, uh, the he had a book on his, on his mantelpiece that was a funny book and it was about robot rights. Even then, it was half poking fun, but half making it a real issue. Like, he felt like there was a time where we, you know, would, would you know, I guess, exploit in the, um, and he was concerned about that. So these are all things that he, he would have been concerned about. Do you think because of the narrative in the film that, we, that, that we're certainly thinking about a particular brand of, not FM's transhumanism, but some of the other characters, where it is, it is much more about not just human um, supremacy, but also the supremacy of, of certain people who will be in power at a certain time, which seems very apropos in terms of some of the things that are going on now. How does that fit in, into... Um, the way you've thought about these strands of transhumanism or posthumanism. Yeah, Johnny, you're absolutely right. Uh, let's say that um, transhumanism uh, um, starts often uh, from the assumption that is written often about this neutral body uh, that can be reshaped in any possible way. The reshaping part I get, uh, the neutral, the body is neutral, I, I don't get. I mean, the body is not neutral. As I mentioned before, uh, the history of all this kind of discrimination show that the body and what the body represents is not uh, neutral in any way. So to me, it's, uh, it's a little naive uh, and maybe a little irresponsible to just uh, focus on an aspect saying, you know, oh, this body that we are reshaping is, uh, you know, gender neutral or race neutral and, and, and age is going to be overcome all these other aspects when, for instance, we know of all the issues that are at present and has been really part of uh, at least uh, civilized uh, life within humans, uh, how all these uh, categories have really placed uh, a, a huge burden of discrimination for people, for every, every person, because I don't think it's some just I don't think that there are just some people who are being discriminated. Also, the people who are discriminating, they're also in their own prison, in their own cage. They also cannot see outside of that layer of discrimination. So both of them are in prison on some level. So to me, uh, if I think of existence, it's definitely not enough just uh, reshaping the possibility of the biological bodies. Uh, We need to reshape the possibility of the social body. And in this sense, uh, and again, uh, with all respect to my wonderful transhumanist colleagues, but their discussion is really little poor. And they're wonderful uh, in really re-envisioning possibilities of the the biological and technological bodies. And in these, uh, they definitely have a lot to say. Uh, And from these, also the posthumanist community can learn. Uh, But about the social body, how can the social body be reshaped? Mm, Maybe the other way. Maybe the posthumanist community can really uh, bring much more insights to the discussion. And the two bodies are not separated. Because obviously the social body is made of individual bodies and individual bodies are always part of some type of social bodies. Even if we are going to live live in in an asteroid, even if it's going to be five people, it's still a social body. It's still a a, a micro unit. So when we think of re-envisioning the human condition, we cannot just, you know, take one aspect and, 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 and think that by changing that aspect, everything else is going to change. I think uh, I like also one of the interviews that you have in your, uh, in your movie uh, about the fact that, uh, you know, technology and, and technological change and social change, they really don't go together necessarily. It's, it's not that you now are going to have all this technology, maybe even the technology of immortality. And by the way, immortality is not used anymore as a term 
because it's considered unprecise, and now it's used like radical like extension. But even once you have to maybe, I think it's going to happen personally. I'm not uh, personally interested in cryonics, but I do see that it's going to eventually be succe uh, successful, not for everyone, depending on how you were cryonized and, and what was your condition before dying and all this stuff. But I have no doubts that eventually it's going to happen. But the point is, uh, what is just the quantity that are you interested in or is the quality? Because for me, as someone who is existing right now, I'm more interested in really taking advantage of my life. And, um, and in this COVID-19, it's really for me an eye opening for everyone. Because I do believe that our society, including myself, and I'm placing myself in this, was becoming a little schizophrenic. It was just about more, more, and more, and more. And when you go about more, uh, you know, more of these, more books, more jobs, more, 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 you are, you are lost in the wheel of more because there is no end to numbers because you can only add zeros. So you can never have enough money because uh, you're always going to be poor because you're never going to have all the zeros that you want. You're never going to be successful enough because there is always going to be people who have more followers or more books printed or more articles or, more, or better jobs. So if you're going to the, the wheel of more, you are going to be lost. And that's where we were, at least some part of you know, societies on planet Earth really were there. And COVID-19, boom, stopped everything. And boom, made us remember that we are going to die. And boom, made us remember that uh, the people we love are going to die. And uh, yes, that maybe may be overcome, although I also like one line in your, in your documentary, which there is always change anyway. So even if, FM2030 is going to come back, uh, he's going to be different. Like, I was different when I was two or three or 10. I mean, we are always in process. We are, we are oceans and we are waves and we are rivers. So definitely, we, are, we, we, are, we have always been uh, into radical life extension. The, one of the first uh, mythologies, Gilgamesh, is precisely about you know, finding the, the search for immortality. So it's been in our mind as a species for a long time. But uh, so I think that, of course, that one is, is, is part of being human, and I'm not against that. But I definitely don't see that as a solution. I do see that some people may need it to find their own voices, to find their own uh, uh, question answer, you know, to find the fulfillment in the, existential, in the existential search. But a butterfly only lives one day, and that life is it's worth living. So to me, it's not so much about the quantity, although I'm not against that, but it's really making sure that uh, that you are here right now. And if with COVID-19, instead of thinking, oh, what's going to happen after COVID-19, be right now here, because this is a, a priceless time of you being with yourself. And, uh, and it, this is, you know, on some level, the dream of like not having to worry about anything because there is nothing you can do about it anyway, just being safe when you go for your shopping pretty much. So I think that um, it's an interesting quest, the quest for, uh, or call it immortality, immortality or radical life extension, but I'm also now aware through your movie that he was such an inspiring prophetic person that I think that once that was achieved, he would have been absolutely already into something else. Like it's, he was sparkling, he was a fire, come always sparkling new energy, new vision. So I don't see him just as the prophet of the immortal age. I see no. him more as this constant flame of, of you know, uh, being truthful to yourself and to your eyes and what you're seeing now. And what you're seeing now is going to change in, in your quest, you know? FM has a line, which I, I, I'm sure is still in the film, is, you know, the greatest um, achievement we can make is not in our technology or our science, but is, is in a re-envisioning of our outlook. And I think, so, I think that, well, let me ask you, I mean, so obviously we have evolutionary programming that programs all sorts of things and obviously there are exceptions to some of this there's lots of women today who choose not to have children men i don't know that they're choosing but they don't have children too but we see that so in terms how does that dovetail into post-humanism versus transhumanism but also how do you see at least some of these ideas i mean there were ideas that i originally heard from fm but now you hear politicians talking about them, you know, universal basic income and, and various other things, you know, the whole re-envisioning of, or not maybe re-envisioning, maybe relabeling of sex and gender and how we define ourselves in these ways. And that's another thing that I, I, I wasn't uh, also aware about his work, that he was so much uh, 
not only committed, but also excited about all the social movements that were happening uh, while he was alive. And he was bringing that to the conversation as a great example of the human re-envisioning itself. And I know that he bring, bring example of feminism and environmentalists and uh, all these uh, groups that are really bringing new voices to a, a static vision of the human that would have excluded these people. So I, that also, I was really impressed by the fact that uh, he was uh, you know, so supportive of re-envisioning the human, not from the hierarchical top end. Uh, of course, within the canonic uh, terms of hegemonic thinking or hegemonic uh, politics or laws, uh, some group of people had uh, colonized power. Uh, but all these other groups were still going on in their rhizomatic existence, no matter what. Now, from the 60s on, all these voices decided their voice, it was time to have this, their voices heard. It was a time that the other groups stopped talking about them because uh, you cannot talk about others because you don't know what does it mean to be the other. You can only talk about your experience because that's the only thing that you really fully can grasp. And in that sense, a lot of groups, you know, starting from the 60s on, at least in you know, the last century, of course, we can see waves of changes much earlier than that. But they said, okay, enough of, uh, of a man talking about a woman or a white person talking about a black person. Let, for instance, in, in post-colonialism, so people who uh, were coming from a colonialist uh, uh, experience, they said, Gayatri Spivak, let the subaltern talk. Let them bring their voice to tell you who they are instead of you telling them who they are. And in this sense, uh, uh, this is uh, one of the genealogies of the posthuman, uh, sorry, posthumanism. So let's go back a little bit to the two differences. Uh, on one side, uh, transhumanism really located themselves, philosophically speaking, to the tradition of uh, the European Enlightenment, which was based on notions such as progress, uh, such as reason, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And this has uh, been uh, uh, stated in the Transhumanist Declaration 1992. Now, um, that tradition is uh, definitely involved in a tradition of the human that is hierarchical. Because uh, if you even look at the tradition of the Enlightenment, the only people who were, were the voices of these uh, movements, we're talking about 19th century, 18th century, were white men who had uh, property, who uh, had studied, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, yes, some of them said really enlightening things, but with their limits, someone like Kant was still sexist and was still racist, although Kant also had a lot to bring to the world in sense of wisdom. Uh, but you need also to make sure to understand that they were not talking for everyone because they were not. Kant even didn't answer to uh, a question by a, a, another man because he was black. So just to say, uh, we need to understand that everyone come in their own era and they also come with the, with the limit of what some of the main ideas of, of the terror is, 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 is brought to them. Now, few ones, the brave one, are able to ch challenge everything. But most people are just going to accept what is given. I think that of our era, what's something that is uh, given as a given and what is going to be challenged rigorously some centuries from now is anthropocentrism. And the way we treat non-human animals, for instance, farm industry and um, how the dairy industry, uh, et cetera, et cetera, when humans or post-humans or trans are going to look back to this era, they're going to say, how could they people accept that? And they're going to say, hey, that was part of their, you know, they call it episteme, uh, way of you, how you are taught to accept. And it's accepted in our society to give, uh, uh, to, 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 uh, to treat non-human animals inhumanely, unless they're on your own pet and then become property and then you need to respect property are obvious. I know that some centuries from now, they're going to look back at, at us and say, you know, some of them had really good ideas, but wow, they were super anthropocentric. Oh my God, they were super species. So we need to also understand that each era comes with their own limits. About the planet, though, aren't we going to say the same thing just, in, just even in terms of how we've treated the planet? I mean, in terms of money, or is that, is that part of humanism as well? I mean, Absolutely. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, Johnny, absolutely. I brought just one, uh, one example. Of course, of course, uh, definitely, you know, the, the environmental call is definitely part of, uh, of posthumanism. This is why the, the posthuman is relocated, not anymore at the center, the, the ultimate goal, you know, human enhancement, which is transhumanism, but the posthumanism, all right, again, nothing necessarily wrong with that, but what is wrong is looking at the whole picture in separation from everything else. So we need to re relocate the human. Uh, for instance, in relation to non-human animals 
of course, with a planet. Uh, great going to space, but how are we going to space? Uh, is that another colonization? Because enough of that. What kind of technology are we using? How much devastation are we going to bring to space? So it's not just what, but it's also the how. And in that sense, I see posthumanism as a praxis. So it's not just the goal, kind of post Machiavellian. It's not just to achieve something, but how you're achieving that. Because in, in, the, in, the, in the path to achieve that, if you create, you know, there the, were the ancient Roman Tacitus who used to say about the Romans, and he was a Roman, ubi desertum facent, pacem appellant, which means in Latin, where they make, uh, where they create a desert, they call, call it peace, which means they, where they kill everyone, the desert in that sense, that's the call peace, you know? So for me, it's not just, oh, now the Roman Empire is a big empire. How did you achieve that? Going back to us, uh, in this, for me, also, it's, it's a big difference. For me, it's not enough human enhancement if these enhancements come without any, you know, uh, environmental awareness or, or species awareness. I love going to space and I dream about it every day, but how are we going to space? And in this, in this sense, I love one, another line of your movie in which we cannot be afraid of visionaries, but a visionary needs to be brave enough to say stuff that are different from what is the, the common Episteme, what is the common uh, way of thinking? And yes, going to space, but how are we going to space for me is as important. So, in this sense, uh, I see both movements as radical, and the transhumanist movement is radical because it's really challenging some of the historical notion of how to be human. But in that sense, I, I personally see that the post human is kind of go beyond that because it's not just about going beyond the human, it's about going beyond the whole structure that allow you to be human and re-envisioning that experience of being human as, a, as multiple relations, material relations, uh, and relation, yes, to planet Earth, uh, to space, uh, and, and everything else. So in this sense, you know, it's, 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 there are differences. Uh, and sometimes people, they just, you know, like to accumulate, they put everything together. Uh, but it's not correct. And, uh, and it's beautiful that there are different visions because it really means that we're talking about what matter in our society. And it's not just about studying people who are gone. And, uh, and in the case of FM2030, he's really still very actual, but sometimes you know, people are caught in just repeating what other people say without realizing, use your eyes, use your experience, use your insights, use your knowledge. What, what do you see? Is this really okay? Is this really the only way? These questions we need to ask. And he was asking them. That's, those are the big questions that FM 2030 also was pushing us all to ask.